This morning, we want to look into the Word of God and continue, hopefully, what God has begun to speak, but looking at the topic, preparing the Joshua generation. In the Old Testament, there were two generations that brought God's people into fulfilling his plans. There was the Moses generation that started God's plans by saving the Lord's people out of Egypt's slavery. And then there was the Joshua generation that completed the plans of God by entering and conquering the promised land. Okay, keep going on those slides, okay? Keep rolling. God has given different generations specific callings, different times in church history that have required God's people to rise to new challenges and new opportunities. During the New Testament church age, there will be a final generation that will complete the evangelism of the world and will see the second coming of Christ. Our Lord Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness, and then the end will come. In response to his disciples having asked, what, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Jesus said, there's a sign. We can know when Jesus is coming soon. When the church completes the great commission, then the church age will be over, and Christ will return to start his kingdom age in the earth. And so the generation that completes the great commission and sees the coming of God's kingdom, we can call the New Testament Joshua generation. The Old Testament Joshua generation built the kingdom of Israel, built the kingdom of God in Old Testament times. But now we are preparing the way for the kingdom of God and the coming of our king. Our Lord Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36, that no man will know the day or hour of his return. We know it's foolish to fix specific dates for last day's events and for the second coming of Christ. However, while we don't know the exact time, Jesus also rebuked the religious leaders of his time in Matthew 16, verse 3, that they could not discern the signs of the times. We don't know the exact time in God's timetable, but we should know what is the season that we are in. What is the signs of the times? What is God doing in our time? And so we want to understand that. Because back in 1000 AD, they said Jesus is coming at 1000 AD, 1400 AD, Jesus is coming, 1844, Jesus is coming, 1917, 45, 96. Uh, but it could not be because the sign Jesus gave that the kingdom uh, will be preached, the gospel will be preached in all the world, that had not yet come. In our day, we are nearing the finish line. 95% of the world's population now has the Bible in their mother tongue. 94% of the people in the world can hear the gospel by radio or TV. Jesus is not returning tomorrow or next year, but he's coming soon. And we need to recognize that we are in the Joshua generation. The coming of the Lord is drawing near. And the Lord Jesus gave a specific second great prophetic key that does tell us more accurately when that Joshua generation would begin. From Luke 21, verses 20, 24, and 32, we have our Lord said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that its desolation is near, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive into all the nations. Jerusalem will be ruled over by the Gentiles, by foreign nations, until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Then Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation that sees these things come to pass will not pass away, will not all die, until all these things are fulfilled. What generation has seen Jerusalem again ruled over by the Jews after a long period of foreign occupation. Well, first of all, Christ's prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem was fulfilled about 40 years after he gave this prophecy. In 70 AD, 
when the Roman army of General Titus destroyed Jerusalem. From that time, Jerusalem was ruled for about 1,900 years by Gentile or foreign nations. From 70 AD, the Romans ruled for centuries. Then came the Byzantine period when it was from Greece that Rome was being ruled over by foreign powers. Then came, in 638, the first Muslim period. After that, the Crusaders marched in, and then the Muslims took over again until the British, under General Allenby, conquered Jerusalem in 1917, and the British ruled till 1948. At that time, when Israel became independent, Israel only ruled over one quarter of the city of Jerusalem. The Jordan, still the Gentiles, ruling over most of Jerusalem. It was only in 1967 AD that with the Six-Day War that the Jews again began to rule over all Jerusalem. What Jesus had prophesied that the Gentiles, foreign nations would rule over Jerusalem until the time of the Gentiles or the church age was drawing to a close. This times of the Gentiles speaks of the church age because before Jesus' first coming, God worked through the Jews. It was, we could say, the Jewish age. Then, from the first to second coming of Christ, the gospel is being spread through the rest of the world to the foreign Gentile nations. That is the age or the time of the Gentiles. And when Christ returns to start his millennial kingdom, it will be all the believers, both Jews and Gentiles, that together will comprise his kingdom. But the times of the Gentiles has begun to close when God began to reform the Jewish nation, when again from 1967 they began to rule over Jerusalem, the future capital of Jesus Christ, who will be the king of all kings. And so the church age time is now starting to draw to a close. The times of the Gentiles is becoming fulfilled when the gospel is being spread through the nations, and now God is restoring the Jews to prepare for Jews and Gentiles in his coming kingdom. And so Jesus said, this generation that see these things happen, specifically the generation that sees Jerusalem again fully ruled over by the Jews, Jesus said, they will not all pass away. They will not all die before they saw all of these things come to pass. The end of this age and the beginning of Christ's reign on the earth. So 1967 marks a prophetic turning point according to this prophecy of Jesus. For the Gentiles, the key for the second coming is the completion of the Great Commission. For the Jews... The sign of the time is that God is restoring them, bringing them back to their land, preparing them for their coming king. And we know his name. His name is Jesus. And so God is at work, and we are now in the time of the Joshua generation. How many of you were born at 1967 or later? Would you like to stand up? If you were born in 70, 75, 80, 82, okay, congratulations, you are part of the Joshua generation, okay? Now, for the rest of us that couldn't qualify, okay, well, you know, it's true, the Joshua generation in the Old Testament was all the younger ones from 40 and under, but we do have the hope for all of us that don't quite qualify for that anymore. Well, Joshua and Caleb were the leaders of the Joshua generation. And Joshua was 78 years old when they crossed the Jordan and started to conquer. It took them seven years. From the age of 78 to 85, Caleb was, was one of the leaders. Joshua was about the same age. So if we're 70 to 85, we might not qualify to be one of the young ones in Joshua's generation, but we can qualify to be one of the leaders of the Joshua generation. And so how can we help prepare and raise up the Joshua generation? 
that will complete the marching orders of the church, that the gospel will be preached in all the world, and then Christ will return? Let's look at that in our brief few minutes we have left. The differences between the Moses generation and Joshua generation can be seen uh, in a chart we have in slide 16, okay, where the Moses generation was, of course, the first one, and after that came the Joshua generation. And the Moses generation had a slave mentality. Wouldn't you, if you were slave, if you and your fathers and your grandfathers and great grandfathers were slaves for hundreds of years? They had a slave mentality burnt within them, whipped within them, pushed within them, that slavery is okay. Bondage, it's not fun, but it's secure, it's stable. Don't get out of the prison cage. You don't know what it's like out there. So let's just keep in our own little territory and we'll all survive. That was the mentality when they were going out of Egypt as recorded in Exodus 14 and they faced one of their first main troubles. They said, oh, it would have been better for us to stay slaves in Egypt than face these trials and dangers. That was the mentality of the Moses generation. But the Joshua generation was different. They were not born in slavery. They were born in freedom. They were born marching on towards the promised land. And so we can see in Numbers 14, 6 through 9, if you study that sometime, that they had a different mentality, a different mindset, that when trouble came and they saw that uh, there were the foreigns, uh, armies of the Canaanites with all of their high walls and giants and big armies, they said, well, God is for us. If God is for us, who can be against us? Let's go up and take the land. God will help us. They trusted in God, and they were ready to march forward. And the Moses generation always wanted to march backward to the comfort of Egypt, where at least they knew how to live their life as they had for centuries. The Moses generation was reactive, if we look at the next line in this chart. They were always worrying. They were always uh, looking to the past. And, and, and whenever a problem would come up, then they'd cry out to Moses for Moses to fix it. But they weren't forward-looking. They were mainly concerned with their own problems and, and the difficulties of the past. But the Joshua generation was not reactive the, Moses, the Joshua generation was proactive, looking forward by faith. They were going to go in. They were going to conquer. They were, they, God had plans for them that were positive to go forward. When the Moses generation saw God do a miracle, parting the waters of the Red Sea, it was so that the Israelites could, in their fear, run away from the enemy. But for the Joshua generation, when God opened and parted the waters of the Jordan River, it wasn't for the Joshua generation to run away from the enemy. It was for the Joshua generation to march forward and attack the enemy. Do we see the difference? One generation wanting, needing a miracle to escape. The next generation looking for a miracle to go forward and face the enemy and conquer. And so the Moses generation fell short of God's plans, as we can study in Hebrews 3 and 4. But the Joshua generation were the full overcomers that completed God's plan of bringing God's people into the promised land and building the kingdom for their day. We want to be part of the Joshua generation, the full overcomers in our day. If you're young, great. If you're old, well, we can still qualify to be the leaders, possibly even better. So we need to understand in these last days, God is raising up a faith-filled Joshua generation to complete the Great Commission that will triumph over the gates of hell. In Numbers 1330, they said, let us go up and possess the land. We are well able to overcome it. The Joshua generation saw by faith, the possibilities. The Moses generation, by fear, 
just saw all the problems and tried to defend themselves and, and just try to make a comfortable little life while the Joshua generation was ready to break through beyond. The, Josh, the Moses generation could say, well, the enemy is strong. You know, there's, there's all the walls and the giants. And we could easily say, well, you know, the enemies against us are strong and there's not enough finances and, uh, and we need church growth and there's persecution and there's all of these pressures. Yes, but God wants to build a generation of faith that's going to be able to go forward. In Myanmar, the first time I spoke for a gathering of, of about, I think it was 600 pastors. After the service, the first service, uh, some of the leaders came up and we were talking and they mentioned, oh, we had 400, uh, no, we had four spies at the meeting. And I said, four, four spies, government spies? Oh, are, are you afraid? And they said, nah, nah, they send their spies to all the meetings. And actually, we welcome them. Because sometimes it's hard for us to get in believers in the church, so the government provides them for us. <laughs> and they hear the preaching of the gospel, and so many have gotten saved that the government has sped up the rotation of the spies so they won't hear as many messages. And they say, and that way, even more spies are hearing the gospel. That's not the Moses fear of the spies. That's the Joshua faith going forward. The first time I held a pastor seminar in Vietnam back in 1992, uh, we were being chased by the police day by day, uh, but the Holy Spirit kept us once building ahead of them every day. But the next year when I came back, I met with one of the pastors and asked him how he had done that year, and he told me he had been in jail, in prison almost all the year. And I offered my condolences to him. I'm, well, sorry to hear that. He said, sorry? I'm not sorry. They put me in a prison jail uh, with a cell with six men. They couldn't escape my preaching. One by one, I led them to Christ. And after they were all saved, I discipled them. Now we're all out. And all of those men that were in my jail cell are pastors now. That's not the Moses generation being afraid. That's the Joshua generation rising up to go forward past the difficulties. The devil hates proactive, aggressive Christians that believe the word of God. Amen? That believe that greater is he that is in you, that is in me, than the one that is in the world. The devil hates those that really believe that we can do all things through him who strengthened us. That all things work together for good. That we can go forward by faith. And so our Lord Jesus encouraged us and said, the kingdom of heaven is taken by violence, and the violent take it by force. David ran to Goliath, not ran away, he ran towards Goliath. Elijah boldly challenged the 400 false prophets. Moses went to Pharaoh's court to challenge and confront him. And God wants us to be those that trust in our God that we can go forward and confront the enemy. One time when I was one of the leaders of 50 churches on the island of Palawan, back in something like 18, 1984 maybe, uh, one of the churches there, we heard the news of great difficulty that the, that the separatist terrorist rebels had just come in and uh, taken control of their area. And whenever the Christians would go to church and come down the dirt path to their church, there were these rebel terrorists with their M16s in a semicircle, just looking at the people, passing by them into the church. How many of us would want to go to church when the soldiers are lined up looking at everybody walking in? And so we, we prayed, and we said, Lord, what can we do to encourage the, the, the Christians there? And I felt the Lord speak to me, go visit them. And so I went with two national pastors, and as we went past the government lines of the military, and we got into what we knew was no man's land. My uh, companions were getting afraid. And I stopped the car and I said, do we believe God is sending us to encourage them? And they 
They, they kind of believed, yeah. And, you know, I tried to encourage them. Well, everybody knows Filipino pastors are poor. They'd never get any, you know, uh, kidnapping money for you. I'll just tell them if we are captured to just keep me and let you go. And that maybe comforted them a little bit more. But then we prayed until they felt, yes, God is sending us. And we went to that pastor, that church. And the pastor, Talag Tag, when we came, said, Brother Norman, what are you doing here? The rebels are all around. They're watching you. This is dangerous. And I told him, Pastor Talag Tag, we have come to be visible assurance to you. God is with you. God is with his people. That you should stand firm in the gospel. And it wasn't Pastor Talag Tag and the Christians that were run out of the town. It ended up that the Terrorist rebels are the ones that left. We need to stand and at times go boldly forward in the name of the Lord. So God wants us to be able to be those that are the Joshua generation that's proactive, that's ready to go in and fight against the devil to stand our ground and go forward. But another perspective we need to see is not just that the Joshua generation needed renewed hearts and minds of faith to go past the Moses generation, be proactive, to let the waters part, to go in and attack. But there was also, right at the Jordan River, we need to understand they had renewed preparations right before they were to enter the land. And so at the Jordan, as Joshua was seeking God, we read in Joshua 1 and verse 2 that the Lord spoke to him, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, you arise and go over the Jordan and bring the people of God over. There was a fresh word from God, a fresh commission to go forward. And there are times we need to hear a fresh word from God to encourage us that we are to go forward. It's time. There was a time when the Apostle John looked like his ministry was gone and washed up. He was probably in his 80s or 90s, an elderly man when he'd been arrested by the Romans, and they sent him away to a little prison island where it looked like his ministry was gone. He was just alone there, uh, marooned on that island almost. But that is where the Lord chose to give him the book of Revelation, the visions of the apocalypse. And in the apocalypse, as he was receiving these visions, one of the angels said to him in verse in Revelation 10, starting in verse 8, the angel said, go, take the little book in the hand of the angel that stands there. And then when he took it, they said, take it and eat it. And as he ate it, then the word of the Lord to him was, you must prophesy again to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Here was an old man in his 80s or 90s getting a new commission from God to prophesy to the nations, to the kings, to the languages, the peoples. And John wrote the book of Revelation. He went back and traveled around the churches in Asia Minor after he was released from that prison. He went forward, and today, the church is still impacted around the world by how he prophesied again through his writings, through the book of Revelation, and that continues to speak to us. And so, we shouldn't just assume, because we're getting elderly, that it's the end. There was a time when Pastor Bailey started to get elderly. I think he was about 65 and he was taking care of his wife for a number of years, and so he wasn't traveling so much. And some people looking on said, ah, he's washed up. He's stopped traveling. It's the end of his ministry. But it was only at that time that he started to write. And through his writings, multiplied a ministry that today, long after his death, is multiplying and impacting more and more nations. We need to realize God has fresh mandates for his people. There was a man in England 
that had a missionary call. His name was George Mueller. Most of us have probably heard his name. But he wasn't uh, accepted by the missions boards of his day. So he started an orphanage where for many years he saw God miraculously work and gave him over 10,000 orphans that he took care of by faith with no financial provision from man. After that, at the age of 70, he felt the Lord speak to him to start his missions work. And at the age of 70, he entrusted the orphanage to others. He started to travel around the world. And in the next 17 years, traveled over 200,000 miles by horse and by boat. No airplanes back then. And he preached to over 2 million people. No PAs, no electricity, no radio back then. It looked like 70 years old, time to retire. No, for him, it was time to refire. And God brought him into the fullness of his original call to be a missionary. As he traveled, if you take it in a straight line, approximately eight times around the world in a day before modern fast transportation. So God wants us to have a fresh word from God and a fresh consecration. In Joshua 3, 5, Joshua told all of the people, consecrate yourselves to the Lord. It's time we're going to move forward into the promised land. And so they knew that they had to get ready for what God was going to do. Now for us, God can move us into fresh prayer meetings. As Pastor Wallace was speaking, that when they felt that God wanted to bring revival, they started new prayer meetings with the, the elderly in their homes and the, and the church deacons and elders collecting together. In our day, God is raising up many that are fasting as never before and churches that together are having Daniel fasts. If we don't have the health and strength for a complete fast, Daniel fasts where you just uh, stop eating good, tasty, yummy things and sim uh, simple, basic diet and through that consecrate ourselves afresh in that season of prayer. God wants to stir us into fresh dedications, meetings with God again and again. In the Philippines, many of the uh, Zion churches there have uh, have weekly worship services where they don't, yes, they get plenty of teaching and preaching, but they'll just spend nights just worshiping, singing, seeking God, praying, and pressing into God to go forward and meeting with God in new and unusual ways to get breakthroughs into the Joshua generation marching forward to conquer. Now, God's people don't always go forward very willingly. The Moses generation rebelled. We know Jonah had a call from God that he it took a little bit of pressure to get him moving, like getting swallowed by a big fish. Could do it. The early church, we can study, stayed in Jerusalem for several years. It was a blessed experience. They had divine healing, divine provision. People sold their homes and gave money uh, to the apostles. Everybody was taken care of. There was a uh, blessing from God, revival. Everything was comfortable in Jerusalem. But the Lord had said they were to be witnesses in Jerusalem and to Judea, Samaria. They were to go on. And history records they tarried in Jerusalem for some years, not going out enjoying the comfort of their good Christian society. But just as God had a plan B to get Jonah moving, right? plan A, led by the Spirit. Jonah, go to Nineveh. When he disobeyed, God had a plan B. You know, a big fish. Sometimes we get moving in God by plan A, the school of the Spirit. Sometimes we get moving by plan B, the school of suffering. Okay, that God chose Jonah moving, it got the early church moving. In Acts 8.1, we read that a great persecution arose in Jerusalem. And they in Jerusalem were scattered. And they took the gospel into Judea, Samaria, and even traveled as far north and into Syria as Antioch, where a revival started the large church that Barnabas and Paul helped develop and became a mission center. No, God's people don't always go forward when everything's comfortable and pleasant. 
There is a strong sign from God for these last days that was given to the worldwide church back in 2010 at Christ Church, New Zealand, where God sent a strong earthquake to that place, and miraculously, no one died. The earthquake was strong enough that there should have been many deaths, but no, no one died. And when that happened, one of the Christian leaders, the leaders of the body of Christ in New Zealand, flew to Christ Church and started to try to organize a big outdoor Thanksgiving rally that no one died that he wanted to use as an evangelistic outreach to Christ Church, maybe even the nation, to thank God that in that terrible shaking, no one died. When he got to Christ Church, he talked with the mayor, an unsaved man. The mayor said, oh, that sounds good. Yeah, let's have a celebration. Let's thank God. And then he got the permission from a radio station. Oh, we'll broadcast the proceedings for free. Yes, we should celebrate and thank God. And unbelievers unanimously joined together to help start that event towards being completed. But then he went to the leaders of the big cathedral in the center of the city where the big town plaza we see in our overhead was, a great place for a large gathering. And he asked them, can you know that sometimes the city holds big gatherings in the town plaza there, but it was owned by the church. Could they have a big evangelistic rally to thank God no one died? And the leaders of the church were leery. They weren't sure if it was dignified to have a big Christian rally right outside their church. And, and what if they didn't like all of the proceedings? And as they were hesitating, he, he contacted uh, the, the pastor with the biggest church in the city. And that pastor said, oh, I'll join in this if I can control it all, if I'm the leader of it. And then he went to other pastors and some pastors said, oh, our church doesn't join in with other churches. We don't agree with all their doctrine. And, and all of these difficulties came. He had to leave without having organized that evangelistic rally. Couldn't, the unbelievers were ready. The Christians weren't ready. And six months later, God sent a stronger earthquake to Christ's church. And that cathedral came tumbling down. A number, most of the church buildings were either destroyed or so cracked they were rendered unsafe and had to be torn down. And the churches were forced to have services outdoors. Could we have the next slide? One of showing a Baptist church there. And as they held their services outside, the churches gathered together and praised God although many had died, and they finally went outside and evangelized, and people turned to Christ. Not after the first earthquake, plan A, God's mercy, after the second earthquake, and the churches that were hiding within their walls suddenly found they had no walls left. They had crumbled and collapsed. Their old ways got shattered in a minute when God sent the second earthquake. And so we want to be, and I believe that what happened in Christ Church New Zealand is a sign in our days for the last days of what God will do in Christ's church. Now that was the name of a city, Christ Church. But I believe it's prophetic of Christ's church in all the world. Will we be led by the Spirit and go forward and get the breakthroughs in the easy place? Will we? Will we see it's harvest time? Will we be ready to go forward? God wants to have us cross the Jordan, press on forward into his purposes, and be part of the Joshua generation, led by the Spirit, filled with faith, ready to go on. We don't want to be part of the Moses generation that doesn't see the promises fulfilled. Moses said, you're going to go up, you're going to conquer. When you come into the land, you'll do this, this, and this. But Moses never got to enter in. 
those of his generation never got to enter in. We don't just want to preach revival. We want to be in the middle of it. Amen? And so God wants to prepare us that we'll cross the Jordan. We'll hear a fresh word from God to go forward, a fresh sanctification, a fresh faith that we will press on and see the great things of God in our days. We're seeing glimpses of them throughout Asia and many nations. And we want to see those great works also for each of our lives, ministries and churches. Amen? So praise God. Pastor Dave gave us a testimony of what God has done in past generations. I tried to just share very briefly a few things of what God is doing now. And maybe next time we come back, we can get the testimonies of what new things God has done. Thank you. God bless you.